Uh, if you want to be turning your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 12. But also, at the same time, we're going to spend a lot of time, we're going to look at this, this passage, but then we're going to spend a, a good bit of time in, in the first psalm, Psalm 1. So maybe stick a finger in first psalm and uh, in, in Psalm 1, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back to it in just a moment. We're going to start in 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12. We've still got a few more wandering this way, so it takes a while to get down from the balcony when you've got short legs. <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs> hey. So, First uh, Kings chapter twelve. Today, the, the title of today's message is "Be careful who you listen to." You know, we live in a world today that um, there are constant voices everywhere. Uh, I mean, no matter twenty four seven, there there are voices that want to speak into our lives, that want to tell us how we should live, that want to tell us what we should do, that want to tell us what we should buy. They want to tell us uh, this or that or the other. I mean, matter of fact, most of, uh, most of us in here, no matter how, what your age, uh, have something along the lines of this. And uh, if, if you, it, it comes with an app called Podcast. And you can go on, I just challenge you, go on that podcast app and search for anything. I mean, literally anything. Just put in anything. And there is a podcast about it. There is somebody who's going to tell you something about it. Uh, Good, bad, ugly, indifferent. Uh, There are voices everywhere that are trying to speak into our lives and trying to tell us what we should do, how we should vote, what we should do this, how we should do that. They're they're speaking into our lives about everything. And we need to be cautious about who we listen to. We need to be careful that we um, put the right people in our lives, that we listen to the right voices. Because here's the thing. Whether you're asking for it or not, in today's world, guess what? You're going to get somebody's opinion. Uh, whether you, Solicited or unsolicited, you're going to get it. Uh, whether you want it or not, whether you like it or not, you're going to get it. Uh, they're going to try to share that. And actually, in our society, they're even going to try to push some of that on you. And we got to be careful what we let into our minds. You know, Paul said in his writing that he learned to bring every thought captive. And what he meant by that was he learned to capture every thought and in a brief moment decide, is that something that I should meditate on? Is that something that I should really think about? Or is that something that I just need to cast out and get rid of to keep my mind on track for the things that God's called me to do, for the things that God wants me to do and desires me to learn and put into my life? I think that's exactly what Paul meant when he learned to bring those thoughts captive. In other words, not just to let your mind drift off and wonder about any and everything, But to really, when your mind begins to meditate, when your mind begins to focus, that it is focusing on things that are valuable and good and trustworthy. And we have to realize that in life today, nobody can go through life alone. How many of us have been impacted by counsel or advice given to somebody in a positive way or a negative way, have been impacted by that advice at some point in your life? Raise your hand. This is actually an act. So some of you have never had any advice at all. You've never been impacted. Wow. That's amazing. That should have been 100%. Because every one of us, at some point in our lives, good, bad, or indifferent, have been impacted by advice or counsel that we have received uh, from someone or, or somebody or something. And we need to understand that counsel is essential for gaining wisdom. Sometimes human advice may not always be reliable, But God's advice is necessary and trustworthy if we are going to navigate through this thing that we call life. In our passage of Scripture that that we're looking at today, and and really um, I want to just kind of share the story here, and then the principles really come from Psalm 1 that fit into this. But I think, but you can't really get into that without looking at at 1 Kings uh, chapter 12. To set the stage for you, Rehoboam had just taken over as king of Israel and Judah, the United Kingdom. Solomon has passed away. His son Rehoboam has stepped in and is taking over as as king. He's trying to establish his kingdom and and kind of make his way and and see what his kingdom's going to be like. And he has some decisions to make. They they come to him and uh, the nation of Israel comes to him because if you know before, kind of before David, the kingdom had kind of split. You had the, the northern kingdom of Israel and you had the southern kingdom of Judah. 
now since David, for about 80 years since David and Solomon's reign, they've been united. They've been together. They've been one group of people again, just like God intended them to be. But now we come to a crucial junction, and you're going to see as we read this text together the very important nature of listening to the right people and allowing the right counsel into our lives. So if you can and would, stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. Uh, We're not going to read all 20 verses. We'll probably skip down, but we're going to read through some of this just so you get the gist of what's happening. It says, Then Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. Their desire was to stay unified. Their desire was to keep one king of a united kingdom. But when Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard about it, he stayed in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon's presence. Because if you remember reading back, Jeroboam had some problems with him and King Solomon. So Jeroboam had fled. And he stayed in Egypt. But they, the northern kingdom of Israel, summoned him. And Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam. Your father made your, our yoke harsh. You, therefore, lighten your father's harsh service and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Now, we see some wisdom in Rehoboam because in verse 5, he says, he replied, go away for three days and then return to me. So the people left. So he wants to take some time to think about it. Always a smart move. Then King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon when he was alive, asking, how would you advise me to respond to this people? They replied, Today, if you will be a servant to this people and serve them, and if you respond to them by speaking kind words to them, they will be your servants forever. In other words, treat them right. Treat them how they should be treated. Be a servant leader. Be a servant king, and you'll have loyal servants forever. But look at verse 8. But he rejected the advice of the elders who had advised him and consulted with the young men who had grown up with him and attended him. He asked them, what message do you advise that we send back to this people who said to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? Then the young men who had grown up with him told him, this is what you should say to this people who said to you, your fathers made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. This is what you should tell them. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Although my father burdened you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips but I will discipline you with barbed whips or with scorpions, even some say. And then the next verse is going to talk about that Jeroboam and all the people came back after the third day. And David, not David, Rehoboam told them exactly what the younger advisors had said. He said, I'm going to make it harder. I'm going to make it more difficult. And then down in verse 15, the king did not listen to the people Because this turn of events came from the Lord to carry out his word, which the Lord has spoken through Ahijah, the Shalonite, to Jeroboam, son of Nebat. When all Israel saw that the king had not listened to them, the people answered him, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Israel, return to your tents. David, now look after your own house. So Israel went to their tents, but Rehoboam reigned over the Israelites living in the city of of Judah. In verse 20 says, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had come back, they summoned him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. No one followed the house of David except the tribe of Judah alone. Father, thank you for your word. Apply it to our hearts today in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. As I said a moment ago, counsel is essential if we're going to live life. None of us can do life alone. None of us have all wisdom. So we're going to have to seek out counsel. And And when I say a moment ago, all the voices that are out there, there's a lot of really good voices. There's a lot of really good podcasts. There's a lot of really good things that we can listen to that can speak positively into our life, that can, can, give, that can give true godly wisdom into our life. But there is also a lot of garbage. And we have to understand that if, first and foremost, as we look at this passage of Scripture, Rehoboam is not in a bad place as far as seeking advice. As a matter of fact, Proverbs 12, 15 tells us, that a wise person seeks advice, that we should never make a decision many times in a vacuum. We should talk to other people. We should uh, talk to people about things. As a matter of fact, Proverbs twelve fifteen says, a fool's way is right in his own eyes, but whoever listens to counsel is wise. We need to listen to counsel, but we also need to do like Paul, and we need to learn to bring that advice and those words that come into our mind. We need to bring them captive. 
And we need to recognize, is this good advice? Is it bad advice? Uh, rejecting good advice can have disastrous circumstances. Uh, Jesus, uh, I mean, I mean, the, the writer of Proverbs talked about in Proverbs 1, 30 and 31, about people who were not interested in his counsel and rejected all, all of his correction. And it said, they will eat the fruit of their way and be glutted by their own schemes. Human advice can help us to see unseen dangers. Human advice can help us to, 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 to walk in the right path, to do the right thing. As a matter of fact, if you look at this passage of Scripture, Rehoboam went to the advisors of King Solomon. We all know that the, the Scripture tells us over and over again how wise King Solomon was. And it was because he listened to wise counsel. It was because he didn't try to make all the decisions on his own. God had blessed him with great wisdom, but many times great wisdom is being willing to listen to great counsel. And he went to those counselors and they told Rehoboam what to do. They said, listen to them. Serve the people. Be a servant king. Be that leader that they need. Not that maybe you want to be, but that this people needs. And if you'll do that, this people will be loyal to you. They'll serve you. I've read the book many years ago called, uh, by Jim Collins, Good to Great. Many of you probably in, in industry and in uh, different uh, uh, corporations a lot of people read that book it wasn't a spiritual book by any stretch of the imagination but there were a lot of biblical principles in that book a matter of fact one of the greatest ones that I remember as I was reading through that book is that the the leaders that led their corporations to go from good companies to great companies it said the greatest characteristic about the CEOs or the the lead leaders of those organizations is that every one of them were servant leaders servant leaders they weren't looked at as uh, big boss men. They were looked at people who were willing to get in and, 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 and do the dirty work. They were looked at as, as leaders who were willing to get in and serve their employees as they worked alongside them. It's the exact same principle that Jesus taught his disciples. When he stood up that night and washed their feet, he told them, he said, you've seen what I've done, now you go and do likewise. It doesn't necessarily mean going and washing everybody's feet, but what it meant was, is you don't be you should not be unwilling to do the most menial tasks for everyone or anyone uh, who's out there in order to get a chance to share the message of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. That ought to be our ultimate goal. My goal is not to be the boss. My goal is not to be the, the, the lead leader. My goal is to outserve everybody else. You remember when John and James, those sons of thunder, were wanting to sit at the right hand of the Father. They wanted to be in, in positions of power. Jesus said, the one who is least among you will be the greatest. The one who serves the most will be the most respected. Rehoboam disregarded that advice because it wasn't what he wanted to hear. It was wise advice. It was good advice. And because he rejected good advice, it had disastrous circumstances. And you listen to those young compadres. Of him. You know, sometimes the best advice isn't from your closest buddies. I'm just saying. Um, I, you ever been there? And done, everybody, anybody, everybody ever lived that? You don't have to raise your hand on that one. Uh, we've lived that one a little bit, haven't we? Sometimes the best advice isn't from your closest friends. Sometimes it comes from older, wiser counsel. Sometimes it can come from someone your own age or younger. But we, we need to be careful because many times those close friends around us will tell us what we want to hear, not what we need to hear. And Rehoboam got told what he wanted to hear, not what he needed to hear. And he was told that, I tell you what you do, Rehoboam, you don't lighten the load on them, you make it heavier. You tell them, I, I, that, the phrase, my, my pinky's thicker than my father's waist. In other words, I'm a big bad dude. You know, you tell them that you don't mess with me, you mess with me, you know, you, know, you, you get the horns, man, you get hooked, you, you, you get all of it, you, you don't mess with me. That's what he's thinking. I mean, you can, you can see the, the folly in it, can't you? You can see the foolishness of it when you really think about what he's doing here. And because of that, they go back and the nation is now split again. And as you continue to read through 1 Kings and 2 Kings, now a progression starts of wars and battles, brothers against brothers, families against families, relatives against relatives, because... One person didn't listen to wise counsel. You know, we, we have this saying a lot of times that my, my sin or my, what I, my decisions, they, they only impact me. It doesn't bother anybody else. 
Do we, do we realize how much our decisions impact others? They impact our families. They impact our churches. They impact our communities. They impact our employees or our coworkers. Our decisions have long-lasting influence. And we need to make sure that we're listening to the right people. We need to make sure that we're paying attention to the right advice. We have a lot of examples in Scripture of good advice when uh, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, came and uh, told him, said, Moses, what you're doing isn't good. You, you, you're, you're trying to do too much. This is what you need to do. This is how you need to set it up. When Moses spoke into Joshua's life and he gave him good advice about how to lead the nation of Israel, over and over again, we see opportunities where people spoke into life. We also see um, Balaam and Absalom. We, we see some, some bad advice given. We, 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 there's examples throughout Scripture of, of both, and we need to make sure that we're listening to the right people, that we're doing the right things, that we're making the right choices. And this is where I want you to flip over to Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is one of the most fascinating, it's, it's one of the most fascinating psalms of all of them, and it's right at the very beginning. The psalmist talks about two ways. The psalmist, in ver- just those six simple little verses, we're really going to look at probably the first three verses of this today, because it's probably about all the time we have this morning. But he talks about making the right decisions. This whole reality that the psalmist is looking at right here reflects directly on Jeroboam. And if Jeroboam had applied some of this uh, reasoning, he might have made a better decision. He might have kept the nation of Israel together. And so today I want us to look at these three verses very quickly and, and, and realize that we all have decisions to make. We all have voices coming from everywhere, from our families, from our coworkers, from our friends, from the world at general, from the media, from politics, I mean, you name it. There, it's, it's almost like, man, the noise is so loud, it's deafening sometimes. You, you hear this and you hear that. You hear this story, you hear that story. What do you believe? Which way do you go? Well, this scripture talks about, verse 1 especially, talks about learning what to say no to. You know, there, there's some things in life that we just need to say no to. And how do you know what those are? Well, Wisdom is as much about saying no as it is about saying yes. It's knowing when to walk away, to go against the tide, to not follow the crowd, even when they laugh and call you a fool. And this psalm, this this first verse of this psalm highlights three areas where we must learn to say no. First of all, it says, in verse 1, it says, how happy or blessed is the person or the man or the one who does not, this is say no to, does not, number one, walk in the advice of the wicked. There's a threefold pattern that's here that shows us kind of the progression of, of, of bad decisions or listening to bad advice. I'm going to read it and we'll come back and look at it. It says, how happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. You see the, the, the ideology here of walking, standing, sitting. Walking it gives that, that connotation of being uh, uh, affiliated with or, or getting in passing, something that you just hear on the way. Standing means we've stopped. We've stopped long enough to think about it. We've stopped long enough to kind of begin to uh, uh, think about those ideas and even have dialogue about them. And then sitting means we've embraced it. We've sat down with it. We're okay with it. We're even, in many cases, as we'll look at in a minute, Um, what that next word says, we begin to take part in what they are doing. But don't walk with the wicked is the first thing he says. First of all, he says, how happy. Happy is the person or blessed is the person who does not, does not walk with the wicked. Uh, Martin Luther said, seeing that such persons are few upon earth, and they are, the psalmist breaks forth suddenly and says, blessed is the man. What kind of person lives a blessed and rewarding meaningful life? The person who does not walk with the wicked. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. The wicked is mentioned four times in this psalm alone. Where you walk, listen, where you walk will shape your conduct. Who you hang out with will determine how you live. Your parents ever told you that? You ever heard that before? You didn't like it? Um, Oh, I, I can do better than that. It happens, doesn't it? Who you run with, what's the old saying? You run with dogs, 
You're going to get some fleas. I mean, that's just reality, right? Uh, there might be good fleas, but there might be bad fleas, too. I mean, you know, I, I'm not sure I know what a good flea is, but, uh, but you, know, you run with those, you're gonna, it's going to shape your conduct. John Calvin said, it is difficult for us to separate ourselves from the wicked with whom we are mixed up. How men are inclined to turn aside little by little from the right way. It starts with a walk, a mere association with people for whom the things of God matter little, if at all. When we begin to hang out with those kind of folks, when we begin to associate with those people who don't believe the same things we do, who, listen, I understand we have to be associated, we have to be out there sharing the gospel, but we, when we begin to bring those people into our circle, we begin to walk with them, when we begin to hang out with them and listen to the things that they're doing, if we're not careful, before you know it, we'll be walking with them. Be careful where you go. Be wise concerning the people you listen to. I said a moment ago, not all advice or counsel is good advice. Don't walk in the counsel. Don't walk in the advice of the wicked. The next thing says don't stand with sinner. Stand is that gives the idea of hanging around, staying a while, um, stopping to look and listen, hanging around or hanging out with. The path talked about here is, a, is, is basically a way or a manner of life, the way one lives. It says don't stand in the path or the way of life of what? Of sinners. What is that word? That word just simply means those who consistently miss God's mark. Those that, uh, <clears throat> and since their path is their habit of life, they are in the habit of standing on the opposite side of God. Be careful. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful. Listen, when you go and you're, listen, if you're, a, if you're a teacher or you're a Sunday school teacher or you're teaching Bible school and you're looking at resources, be careful when you go to certain websites or you go to certain things, because I know right now everything's at the touch of a button. We don't have to pick up a book to do anything. We just ask Google and just understand that Wikipedia is probably not a good resource because I can go in and put a definition in Wikipedia and you may not want to read my definition. Be careful because that you, when you go to websites that are touting all this, make sure you go and read what they're about. Make sure you understand who they are and what they believe. Because if not, you'll find yourself standing in the path of sinners, and before you know it, you're spouting what they believe, and you've embraced what they believe, and it's contrary to the Word of God. Rather than taking a stand for Jesus that all can see, you take your stand with those who oppose Him. Their priorities become your priorities. Their way of life is more important than Christ's way of life. Sin becomes your pattern and sinners your partners. Instead of imitating Christ, as Paul admonishes us to do in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, we imitate the world and we imitate sinners. Don't walk in the advice of the wicked. Don't stand in the same pathway of life as sinners. And finally, don't sit in the company of mockers. The idea of sitting here means you've moved from thinking like the wicked to living like the rebellious, to ridiculing like the cynic. This way of life is now your home. This is where you sit. You're comfortable here. The things of God not only do not matter, you mock them just like the fools do. It says don't sit in that path of the scornful. This person is the person with a quick wit, sharp tongue, the person who lives for this life and says, forget the life to come. Proverbs 21 says, it's a proud and haughty man is a scoffer. Proverbs 15, 12 says, a scoffer does not love one who corrects him, nor will he go to the wise. Proverbs 3, and 35 says, the curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the just. Surely he scorns the scornful, but he gives grace to the humble. The wise shall inherit glory, but shall... But shame shall be the legacy of fools. Peter Kreeft said it well. He says, we are whatever we love. We are whatever we love. We will become whatever we love. And the psalmist warns us, be careful what you love. You see, if we're going to make wise decisions, if we're going to pay attention in, in, in to the advice, we got to know what to say no to. And how do you do that? How do you know what to say no to? You do that by knowing what to say yes to. 
And the psalmist just flips it around right in verse 2 and tells us. He says, instead, it's a transitional word there. He says, instead, instead of walking and standing and sitting with all the scornful and the sinners, instead, his delight, the one who's happy, the one who's blessed, his delight is in the Lord's instruction. He meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. You see, the psalmist went from the negative case to the positive case. Know what to say yes to. What do you say yes to? How do you, you want to live according to God's plan and promise? Well, first and foremost, you have to say yes to God's word. It says delight in. He takes delight in the Lord's instruction. It just simply means the Lord's law, in the law of the Lord. He takes, he takes pleasure in and delight in God's word. The person who, this person loves the Bible. He loves the word of God. It is a joy, not a burden to learn and live it. Such a person will accept no shallow imitation or deceptive counterfeit as enticing and as appealing as the world may try to make it. Can I tell you something? That's exactly why a year and a half ago we got serious about wanting to read the Word of God as a church. That's why I ask you, I'm, 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 I'm actually asking you to never stop. I know we're in the middle of year two. Some people say, well, I've already done that. I kind of checked that off. I read through the Bible last year. Good, I'm done. I'm a, I'm a good little Christian. I got another notch on my belt. No, we need to stay in it. Because how many of you understood, anybody here that understood everything you read last year as you read through the Bible? Okay, good, because I didn't. Um, yeah, and, and if you were, I was going to invite you up. Um, so, why do we, so that's why we need to read it again. And read it again. I, we, we've been having some great discussions on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights because there's so many little nuances that we've missed before that now are coming to light as we get more familiar and more familiar and more familiar with the Word of God. We take delight in it. It's a joy. It's not a burden. I love the Word of God. You should love the Word of God. Say yes to God's Word because it's God's Word that will transform my life. It's God's Word that will show me what's right. It's God's Word that will show me what's wrong. It's God's Word that will give me wisdom to make the right decision and to know which voices are telling me the truth. Say yes to God's Word. Delight in the Lord's instruction. Say yes to God's Word. Say yes to God's wisdom. He goes on in that verse and says he meditates on it day and night. He thinks it over by talking to himself continually. It's like the Lord told Joshua in Joshua 1.8. When Joshua was just taking over the leadership of the nation of Israel, and the Lord spoke to him, he said, Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you should meditate on it day and night, that you would observe to do all that is written in it. For then... You will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. God's wisdom is found in knowing God's Word. God's wisdom is found in meditating on God's Word. It's His priority. It's our passion. He knows what He believes and why He believes it. Can I ask you, what do you think about when you daydream? What do you sing about when you take a drive or go on a walk? What comes to your mind and fills your heart when tragedy strikes and disappointment comes? In a 24-hour day, a 10,080-minute week, a 2,592,000-second month, how much time do you give to memorizing and meditating on God's Word? Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. The voice that we need to be listening to is the voice of God's word and the voice of God's wisdom. And finally, saying yes to God's will. Verse 3 said, He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in, in its season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Proverbs, Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says that God's will is good, acceptable, and perfect. The psalmist says God's will is fruitful and prosperous. Now, I want to I 
get rid of a myth. You know, I'm going to be myth busters here for a minute. Um, do you know what the, the will of God is not? The will of, will of God is not a mysterious journey in a mysterious place that you're trying to search out and find. We have this idea that somehow we just, oh, if I could just know God's will. It's pretty simple. The Bible says over and over again, obey my commandments. You know that's God's will? You know, we've created this, this idea that God's will is some mysterious, you know, lifelong hunt and search. You, you know what I found? People, I, for 23 years, I've had people come to me over and over again, almost yearly, and say, Pastor, I'm just having a difficult time finding God's will. Would you pray that I would know God's will for this? It's kind of, and I kind of relate that to me. Back when I was about 19 years old, the Lord, I, I felt distinctly that the Lord called me to, to ministry. But for the next six years, I worked a lot of jobs. I finished school. I worked several different jobs. I never was without a job. I never went looking for a job. I always had one, but I always hated it. And I always wanted something better, and I always prayed for something better. And every time I got it, it was something worse. And then I kept praying for something better, and I kept getting something worse. And, and I kept saying, oh, God, what is your will? I just can't find your will in this. And God said, I told you my will six years ago, but you're running from it, dummy. Once you get in it, you'd be okay. What I've found is most people who are searching for God's will, they already know what it is. They just don't want to do it. Except it's quiet. I feel that. There's a lot of times I don't want to, you know, you know, what, you know what I heard somebody say one time, and it's the greatest statement ever. He said, I don't worry about God's will anymore. I just do what God's word says. And the more I do what God's word says, the more I find myself in the middle of God's will. We had this, we had this craziness of, was it God's perfect will or God's permissible will? That's the dumbest question I've ever heard. Where is that in the Bible? I mean, which, which book is that in? It's not there. Because God is not concerned. Listen, God says, here's what my will is. Go and make disciples of all the nations. Here's what my will is. Go wherever you go, whatever job you do, and do it for all for the glory of God. Whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do it all for his glory. That's his will. That's the reality. I don't need to go searching for that. I don't need to pray about that. I just need to be obedient to the word of God. And as I'm obedient to the word of God, guess what? I'll find myself exactly where he wants me to be. And you know what I'll be when I do that? When I surrender to God's will, what word, and I surrender to God's wisdom, you know what I'll be? I'll be like a tree planted by a flowing stream of water. It has a constant flow of water coming to it. And if you've ever been around trees that have a constant flow of water to them, man, they bloom and they blossom and they put out the fruit that God's called them to put out. And they just over and over and over and over again keep putting out fruit and leaves. Their leaves don't wither. Their, li we, their leaves don't fade. Why? Because they have a constant source of nourishment. And what the psalmist is saying is when I'll stay in God's word, I'll listen to his wisdom, I'll be just like that tree. Because I'll never lose. And the source of my sustenance, the source of the fruit of my life, the source of the leaves of my life, the source of the beauty of my life will never dry up. Why? Because he never changes. Because he never runs out of wisdom. <laughs> His word is the same, and he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's nothing more beautiful. If you've seen pictures, I've never been there. Some of you may have. Than to be in an arid desert of the Middle East and to see the picture of a beautiful fruit-bearing tree located by the streams of water that they would have been very familiar with. This life is a healthy, fruitful, and successful life. Not in man's eyes, but in God's. The life, this life is worth living. It means something. It matters. It trusts God to plan it. It trusts God to prosper it. And this is a happy person because the road he travels is the road that pleases God. Why? Because he walks in the counsel of the godly. He stands in the path of the righteous. He sits in the seat of the hopeful. 
He studies the word, he acts with wisdom, and he is devoted to doing God's will. Rehoboam had that chance. But he chose to listen to the outside voices. He chose to listen to those who didn't know the things of God. He chose to listen to those who didn't have God's best in their mind. What are you listening to? What is it that you're allowing to speak most into your life? Is it the word of God? Is it wisdom of dear saints of God who have stood the test of time? When you are faced with a difficult situation in your life, who do you run to? Do you run to people who you know are going to give you biblical wisdom? Or do you run to people who are going to tell you what you want to hear? It's the biggest question we can ask in our lives. Because if we run anywhere but the Word of God, we're running to a place where it's not going to turn out well. Rehoboam, I'm not saying that somebody else wouldn't have made it, but Rehoboam made a decision that caused the nation of Israel decades, centuries of struggle and hardship and difficulty. And we're not going to blame it all on him because other people had a chance to turn it back. We get that. But here's the reality. That one decision made a huge difference. Let's learn to bring every thought captive. Let's learn not to walk in the pathway of sinners. Let's learn not to stand with them. Let's learn not to sit with them. But let's learn to listen to God's word. Let's get in God's word and allow him to speak into our hearts. First and foremost, by, by, by recognizing and helping us understand that we are lost sinners desperately in need of a Savior. Contrary to what our world says, everyone here needs a Savior. And when we listen to him, we surrender our life to him, guess what? He says he'll give us everything we need to walk this life for his glory, for our good, for success and prosperity and grace and mercy. And can I just tell you something? I'm just thankful for it. Because can I tell you every single day what I'm made more aware of? I'm made more aware of my need for his grace. That I don't have it all together. I'm far from it. And I need the marvelous grace of Jesus to transform me. And guess what? So do you.